I want to talk about the topic of expectations. Living up to expectations of people. And how this just puts you in bondage. And is a burden and will get you burnt out. In 1 Corinthians 4.7. Look at 1 Corinthians 4.7. It says, For who maketh thee to differ from one another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? He said, For who maketh thee to differ from one another? That's also something I'm talking about too, is we're all different. God doesn't make us all the same. So we can't expect out of each other what we expect out of ourselves. We can't expect out of each other even what God is expecting for each one of us as individuals. He's got different things he's got planned for us. And putting all these expectations on each other uh, that we expect out of ourselves or that we believe God is expecting out of us as individuals, it really puts a burden on people. And really puts them in bondage to you and your list of standards that you have. But it said, who maketh thee to differ from one another? We're all different. You know, Job 37, verse 7 talks about how he sealeth up the hand of every man. That all men, but that all men may know his work. The Lord seals up the hand of every man. Look at your hand. Look at your fingerprints. It's different from everybody else's. Think about your voice. Your voice, for the most part, voices are different. Like, for example, at work, we got our uh, our walkie-talkies, radios, and whatnot. And when somebody talks on that, out of all the people there, by the voice, you can generally tell who's speaking without them saying even saying their name. See, we all got different voices for the most part. Our faces look different for the most part. Even twins, you can mostly tell who's who if you know them for a while. Voices are different. Faces are different. Fingerprints are different. People are different. God made them with a variety. Like in uh, 1 Corinthians fifteen forty one, the Lord says, One star differeth from another star in glory. And that's in the context of the resurrection as well. So I believe even our glorified bodies, which will be like the Lord's glorious body, and we'll be like Him, we'll see Him as He is. Our body will be like Jesus Christ, but I still think there will be variety there. Just as one star differs from another star in glory. And you know, angels in the Bible are referred to as stars. I believe each innumerable the innumerable company of angels is variety. Different names, different look, different voice, different things expected of them. In uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11, and 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 31, it shows you differences. It'll show you different jobs. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11. It says, Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But all these work at that one and the self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. You see? He's given every man different stuff. All the body of Christ got different stuff different job, different gift, but it's the same Lord. 
And he goes on in verse 12 to say, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. It's the body of Christ. We all saved people make up the body of Christ. And we're many. And it says, If the foot shall say, Because I am not of the hand, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the foot, I have no need of you. Nay, much more these members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. You, say, you see, just like your, your hand can't say to your eye, I don't need you. It needs the eye. To see what to pick up. You see? Just like you can't look at another member of the body and say, well, you need to be doing exactly what I'm doing. Or I don't need you because you're not doing exactly what I'm doing. That's crazy. We all got different skills, different jobs, different gifts. And when you imagine the hand saying, I need, I I need you to pick up stuff. That's crazy. That, But that's what God compares the body of Christ to. Is the body. Imagine if the eye said to the hand, Hand, I need you to see stuff. That's not going to work. God's got it. The body, and He has certain jobs for you. And he, it says in Ephesians 2.10, we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. The body of Christ is His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. You're a new creature and you got a job that He wants you to do and it's different from others. You know, there's different people in the work. Think about it. Even just look at the Bible characters, for example. All the different types of people that God used. You got Luke, who's a beloved physician, in Colossians 4.14. It calls him the beloved physician. It, you think about Matthew, a tax collector, in Matthew 9.9. 9. You got John, Peter, James, Andrew. They're all fishermen, in Matthew 4.21. You read and see, the, they're fishermen. Matthew 4.18, Matthew 4.21. You got Paul, he's a Pharisee. Philippians 3, 5. Paul was a tent maker. The apostle Paul was a Pharisee before he was saved. You got Adam, a gardener. Genesis 2, 15. See, he uses different types of people. I mean, Luke, a beloved physician, much different than some fishermen. A tax collector. Matthew, much different than the rest. Then he uses learned men, and he uses unlearned men. Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, Acts 7.22. But then you got Peter and John, who Acts 4.13 says were unlearned and ignorant. You know, in the Old Testament, he's got kings, like Josiah, Hezekiah. He's got warriors, like Joshua and Caleb. He's got prophets, like Jeremiah and Ezekiel. He's got guys like David who was a king and a warrior and a prophet and a priest. You see, he's got different uh, types of stuff for each person. You got different skills. Like in Daniel 1.17, you got Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They had been given the skill in all learning and wisdom. God had given them this skill. That he doesn't give to everybody. Then over in Exodus 31, 1 through 5, he got this guy named Bezalel, and he had a God given skill and wisdom 
to work in gold and silver and brass and cunning works. You know, to be able to carve things, make things. You know, God gives out different skills to different people. So the Lord has given you your skill. Not everyone has that skill. So you don't need to just go around with your skill and look down on people that don't have your skill and say, well, that person's not right with God because they're not doing what I'm doing. They, don't, they can't do what I'm doing. You work with what God has given you. Don't try to demand it out of everybody else, you see. God's given you your gift, your skill, and when you go around demanding that out of all the other Christians and then claim they're not right with God for not doing what you're doing, you're really just abusing your gift and you're losing out. Most likely, you're going to lose out on rewards. You're discouraging people, and it, it just it, you make things really hard on people. You you're binding heavy burdens, grievous to be borne. You're just going to make them discouraged and defeated. God didn't equip them with what He's equipped you with to be able to do what you need to do. You know, there's different convictions in Romans fourteen one through six. It says, Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. See, some people think it's wrong to eat certain things. Some people don't think it's bad to eat certain things. Uh, that's their convictions. There's different convictions. It says, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holding up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, and another, another man esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. You know, some men think a certain day is more holy than another day, or better than another day. Not everybody has the same convictions. For example... You know, we all go to church on Sunday, but some people see Sunday as the Lord's Day. And they will not do certain things on Sunday that they will do on another day. Now, I, I'm not like that. I esteem every day alike. Maybe you esteem Sunday above other days. And there's some things that you'll do on other days that you won't do on Sunday. And that's that's fine too. If you want to have a day that you got set aside where you don't mow and do all this other stuff, that's, that's cool too. But I esteem every day alike. Uh, I'm, I don't do more spiritual things on Sunday. Honestly, I get less spiritual things done on Sunday than all the other days. I'm so busy going back and forth to church. And then you go eat out after church. And then by the time you get home and uh, settle in, it's almost time to go back to church. And then you just got to get right back in the car and you turn around and go back. You know, I end up, I'll, I'll probably read less Bible on Sunday and study less Bible on Sunday than all the other days just because I'm so busy going back and forth, back and forth. Now, through the rest of the week, you know, mo mo I wake up Monday morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, and it's study time from the time I get up all through work. I'm either reading the Bible on break, listening to it while I'm working, listening to preaching, whatever. You know, I don't, for me, this is a way of life. This is my life. The Bible's my life. God is my life. It's not just, like, when I exit those doors, that church, when I exit that church building, I don't just say, okay, I'm out of the presence of God now. It's time to, uh, like, Sunday night after church, I don't say, okay, well, the Lord's Day, it's, it's over now. It's time to, you know, get back to normal. No, no. This is this is my life. It's every day. Every day. I esteem every day alike. That's me. Now if you if Sunday's your day where you you that's your big time spiritual day where you do spiritual stuff, okay. But that's not for me. That's why for me, 
I'll be honest with you, if I didn't get a chance to mow throughout the week, I'll mow after church on Sunday. And a lot of people would look at that and say, well, that's that's wrong. You you can't mow on Sunday. I can't mow on Sunday. How is it different than any other day, you see? Um, so they, they think you're not right with God if you mow on Sunday. My papa was like that. He He would not mow on Sunday. But you go home and you watch TV on Sunday, don't you? I mean, you're going to get in more trouble watching a TV than you would on a lawnmower? Or you're going to get in more trouble on a lawnmower than you do watching TV? You do all this other stuff on Sunday. You pull your phone out and you look at Facebook. You're going to get more in trouble. You're going to get in more trouble on a lawnmower or on Facebook. You see, you'll always it always comes back to being hypocritical a little bit. But if you don't want to, I'm just saying be consistent with it. If you're not going to mow on Sunday, then don't do all that other stuff either. You know, you'll have people that they'll try to push this conviction on others of, well, Sunday is the Lord's Day. You, uh, you shouldn't work on Sunday. Now, that's, that's crazy as well. Because, you know, the other day I was leaving church and you know what I heard? fire trucks and ambulances police cars and I'm thinking I'm glad that they're at work today somebody's house will be burning down somebody would be dying somebody may be getting shot at but we've got ambulance firemen police officers but you're going to look at them and say you dirty devil working on Sunday you ain't going to say that when your house is burning down, when you're getting shot at on Sunday. You know, just because that they didn't come to your church service does not mean that they're not right with God. They may be more right with God than you are. You see, I get so sick of, of hearing that junk. You, you got your religion and whatnot where you go to church and you wear, you put on your Sunday best and you got this religious thing worked out and then you go to, to to work and you talk to people like a dog and you complain and nobody wants to be around you and you are a horrible testimony and just making it hard on all the other Christians that want to be a good testimony. And then you point the finger at these people that aren't doing what you're doing that don't have your same convictions. You're the one that should be ashamed. So people's got different convictions. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another man esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. It's hard about that. <clears throat> got different convictions. Different to traditions. You got different likes. You got different uh, desires. And so on and so forth. Different burdens to carry. You know, before you go judging somebody and what they're doing and what they're not doing, and, you know, everybody's got their burden and their little hobby horse tradition that they got, and they want to look down at everybody because, well, they just don't have that same uh, burden as I've got. And then you look down on them. Well, we've all got different burdens to carry. You know, you're some maybe you're somebody that your wife just loves just loves the Lord, just loves the Bible, just, just, maybe she even got saved before you did, and, but then, you, so, in your situation, you don't understand this guy over here, who's a good man, he's trying to serve God, but his wife doesn't care about the Lord, his wife doesn't care about reading the Bible, his wife doesn't care about doing anything spiritually speaking and so he's just not as zealous as you are well put yourself in his shoes for a minute imagine if back before you were even saved your wife wasn't saved either she didn't go to church she didn't read the bible and then maybe somehow some miracle you still got saved 
and your wife still doesn't go to church, still doesn't read the Bible, still doesn't want to do anything spiritual, are you going to be as zealous? Are you going to be, you know, just as easy to judge everybody around you? You know, it's a lot easy without that burden of, of, of having, you know, if, you, if your spouse loves God and the Bible and tries to do right, that's, that's a burden that you don't have. When your spouse does not want to go to church, does not want to read the Bible, does not care about the Lord, that's a burden on the back of a saved person. And you need to have sympathy with that person instead of just expecting them to be as zealous and as uh, available as you are. You need to consider these things. You need to consider those who have unruly children as well instead of just judging them all the time imagine if your children were like that and quit pointing the fingers and saying well they need to get right with god well maybe if your kids was like that you wouldn't be right with god either you got to quit thinking that people can live up to all these expectations and convictions and standards that you've placed on yourself those are your expectations convictions and standards you know unless you can go to the bible and pinpoint where this person needs to be doing this certain thing to be right with god you shouldn't place that burden and conviction on them because that's your own thing like i said i've got my own burdens and convictions that i've placed on myself and if i don't do those things then i don't feel like i'm walking close with god but that's my own standards, my own personal convictions. I'm not going to try to put those things on somebody else. But I want to show you also some characters in the Bible who did not who did not live up to expectations. One of them is King Solomon, for example. You know, King Solomon, he's given wisdom. He's given understanding more than anybody. He's given wisdom and understanding exceeding much and largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore, 1 Kings 4.29. And all this wisdom he had, it excelled all the wisdom of all the children of the east country and all the wisdom of Egypt, 1 Kings 4.30. And everybody came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. But he didn't live up to what you might expect. Look at 1 Kings 4, or 1 Kings 11, 1 Kings 11, 4. For it came to pass when Solomon was old. So this is after he's gotten all the wisdom. Not only the wisdom that God gave him, but the wisdom that he, that he got from just living life and the wisdom that he would have just obtained in his old age. It came to pass when he was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Then did Solomon build the high places for Chemish, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Moloch, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. He didn't live up to expectations. I mean, if, you're, you, if you are given all this wisdom and understanding and largeness of heart and all these riches by God himself... You're going to have this expectation on you that you are going to finish your course. That you're going to be the greatest king that ever was. That the land is just going to be in just this terrific shape after you pass on. But Solomon didn't live up to expectations. And I mean, if Solomon, the wisest man ever, King David's son, doesn't live up to expectations... There's a good chance you're not going to live up to expectations. Especially if you're putting even more expectations on you, on yourself, than God has for you. All these people around you, 
are not going to live up to your expectation when you got even more expectations on them than God has on them. And I'm saying this to break some chains from you, break some chains of bondage, and to make you realize that just because you haven't lived ex the expectations doesn't mean it's over for you. It doesn't mean that you're just this horrible person compared to everybody else. A lot of the expectations you have on yourself and that people have on you are not even in the Bible. And they're making you feel like you're not saved. They're making you feel like you're not a good Christian. They're making you feel like that you're just horrible and you're just walking down in the dumps all the time with your face towards the ground over some stuff that's not even in the Bible a good portion of the time. And they're not that great, their self. The people, nobody is that great as they make themselves out to be. And God loves you as much as he loves the next saved person. And just because you don't live up to all these expectations doesn't mean it's over for you. King Solomon didn't live up to expectations. Think about the first man, Adam himself. He had a perfect mind. He had a perfect home. He had a perfect wife. He owned the world. He was given dominion. Genesis 128. He was given dominion. He was the golden child, you would say. I mean, he was made from the dust of the earth in the land of Havilah where there is gold in that area. And you know what? The golden child brought sin into the world. The golden boy brought sin into the world. He didn't live up to expectations. He really dropped the ball on that. You would think of the a guy that didn't even have a sin nature, that never even seen a TV or a laptop or a filthy magazine. You would think he would have really finished his course and did everything that was expected of him. No, he dropped the ball. If Solomon and Adam don't live up to expectations, mostly likely you're not going to live up to all expectations. Consider Noah, a just man, perfect in his generations, walked with God, built the ark, started the population over, called a preacher of righteousness by God himself, he got drunk and he laid naked where his son could see him. You know, imagine you just had this great victory. You are starting over the world. You build an ark that everybody's going to be talking about for thousands of years later. You get drunk and lay down naked where your son can see you. He didn't live up to expectations either. What about Abraham? Abraham was picked to be a father of many nations. He wiped out five armies with 300 of his trained servants. He would have offered Isaac if the Lord let him. He's got all these credentials that go on and on and on. and So you would be expecting a lot about, out of this guy. He, he, and he did a lot of things that you wouldn't expect from this guy. He lied about his wife, not once but twice, because he was afraid. A guy that took out five armies is afraid to die for his wife. A guy that was going to offer his son was afraid because of his wife. And then he took his wife's handmaid for a wife because he couldn't wait on God as well. He didn't always live up to expectations. That's Abraham. What about David? David, the, the toughest, roughest guy in the Bible just about. He killed a lion and a bear. He killed Goliath. He killed 200 Philistines and brought their foreskins back to Saul to earn the right to marry his daughter-in-law. David took another, another man's wife. The same David that had enough faith in God to face Goliath, to f kill all these Philistines, to face a lion and a bear, to grab a lion by its beard and smote him, 
He lied and he took another man's wife that tried to lie and cover it up by getting that wife, uh, that wife's husband drunk and everything else to cover up the pregnancy, make it look like it was the man that got his own wife pregnant. He ha And he ends up killing Uriah the Hittite. David didn't live up to expectations. What about Peter? Peter walked with Jesus. Peter walked on water. He's the only one that had enough faith to get out of the boat and walk on the water. But what did he do? He said he would never deny the Lord. But what did he do? He denied the Lord three times. You got to watch out saying this, I'll never do this and I'll never do that. And you think that you're this great Christian and you think that you're never going to get out of the will of God. And you think, well, I'm older now. I'll never get away from God. I'm not going to be like you other people out there. But what happened? It came to pass when Solomon was old that his heart was turned away from the Lord. It, it might happen to you. And you got all these expectations on yourself that God hadn't even put on you. You got all these expectations that you have on other people that God's not put on them. And you're just making it harder and harder on yourself and everybody else. And, I mean, it's hard enough. The Christian life is hard enough. We don't need a hundred other expectations on your good Christian list to live up to. And you're making it harder on yourself by putting all these expectations on yourself that it's going to be hard to live up to. When the things, when you make the things that you do define you and give you your identity as a Christian or all these things that you do, you got that these expectations you put on yourself, there's going to come a day when you can't fulfill that list anymore and you're going to be very depressed. You're not, you're not in the Lord's family because of the stuff you're doing. You're in the Lord's family because you got the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You're not in good standing with God because of this big list of stuff that you fulfill every day. You're in God's family because, and you're in God's good standing because he gave you the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the only one in the Bible who ever lives up to every expectation. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only one. Isaiah 14, it prophesied his virgin birth. What happened? He was virgin born. He lived up to the expectation. It says he's going to be born in Bethlehem. What happens when he's born? He's born in Bethlehem. It said he would be pierced and seized and not fight back in Isaiah 53. What happened? He was pierced and seized and he didn't fight back. It says he's going to be a lamb without blemish and without spot. Well, he's a lamb without blemish and without spot. He said himself, he put the expectation on himself to rise again the third day. What happened? He rose again the third day. The expectations he didn't live up to are the ones that weren't part of the plan. The only ones that he didn't live up to were the ones that weren't even going to happen. You know, they thought that he was going to just bring in the kingdom when he came the first time and not even not die on the cross. That's an expectation they put on him that wasn't even that wasn't even part of God's plan. He had to die on the cross. He had to get the crown of thorns before he gets the good crown, before he gets the gold crown, before he gets the king of kings crown, you see. And it's hard for you to live up to expectations successfully that God isn't helping you live up to. You know, you're putting all these expectations on yourself and other people that God's not even a part of. So it's really hard for them to live up to that expectation. You're putting expectations on them that are for you, that God, maybe God's put a burden on you, and you're trying to put that burden and everything else on all these other people when God has something different for them. But the dangers of expectations is you're going to end up defeated and discouraged and feeling like you're just this horrible person that can never be a good Christian, can never 
live up to all these people's standards around you. And you won't be able to ever live up to all these people's standards around you. What you got to do is stay in close fellowship with God. Do what the Bible says to do. Read your Bible. Pray. Talk to the Lord every day. Just do your best. That's all you can do. You're not going to be able to fulfill this other person's list of standards. You're not going to be able to fulfill your own list of standards. But you have to remember, you're not in the family of God because of this big list of things you have to perform. You are in the family of God because of the grace of God, because God put you on there for believing on Him, and God put you on there when you didn't deserve it. It's only the Lord Jesus Christ that can live up to expectations.